Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. We're glad to welcome you uh, to Dr. Ray's first official kind of press conference. <laughs> we're delighted to, uh, yesterday the board voted on his official contract, so we're delighted to be with us, uh, with all of, for all of you to be with us today. Uh, Dr. Ray is going to go through his presentation, and then after that we're going to take questions, so I'll have field the questions, so please hold any questions until the end and until he finishes his presentation. So, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Doris Ray, our superintendent. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I look forward to working with each, each of you in the upcoming weeks uh, and months to come. Uh, I know and appreciate the job of keeping our community informed. And we'll do our best to assist you. I fully trust our communications team to manage your requests for information. So today, we're going to kick off our partnership. And this morning when I got up, I have a 17-year-old son and and walking around the house, and I didn't know what tie to wear. And he said, Dad, wear that funny green tie you wear. And I said, why should I wear this tie? He said, it's calming, and green means renewal. And that's what we, we are about at Shelby County Schools. Hope and hopes and dreaming dreams. So today, I want to talk to you about my entry plan. But before I start, I want to recognize two very important, special people to me uh, that's in the audience. Uh, two board members, Ms. Stephanie Love and Ms. Joyce Doris Coleman. Also, I want to recognize members of my cabinet who just raised your hand and the principal here at East T STEM, Miss Alicia Brooks. So, thank you all for being here. And let's just jump right in. So, as you know, you heard of the Destination 2025 80, 90, 100. 80% 80 of our seniors uh, will be college ready, 90% will graduate on time, 100% of college ready graduates enrolled in post-secondary opportunities. You guys are very familiar with this. So today I want to talk to you about the seven next steps to Destination 2025. If I was teaching, I would have the students repeat it. So I want the students to repeat it. Seven next steps, seven next steps. to Destination 2025. To Destination 2025. So we want to be all inclusive. We have the young men here from East T STEM that's going to assist me today with my presentation. So, thank you. Seven next steps to Destination 2025. We're going to leave with academics. Academic equity and action plan. Dr. Burke, raise your hand, Dr. Burke, our chief academic officer, laid out a robust plan and a direction that we're going to go in the next few months to come. And I believe the seven next steps is, or the seven next steps are the right direction we need to go in as a district. And the, the academic equity plan will get us and move us in the right direction. So let's talk about a few points. And I have students here that's going to assist me. They're going to assist me. And we're on track to graduate students. 79%, I think our goal is 90, so we're on track. We're moving. However, of 79% on track to graduate, 
only 23% of our students, 23% of our students, now these students represent number of graduates, only 23% of our students, two, made a 21 or higher on the ACT. That indicates, one of the indicators, that you're college ready. That's a problem. We have to do something about it. With that being said, these are some steps that we're going to take to get us there. One is zone for continuous improvement. We ask some schools to come out of our zone, and we don't want them to revert back to the I zone. So the zone for continuous improvement is the safety net of support to give schools to keep achieving. Another is we have to work on our rigor. Again, 21, 21% or 23% of our students scored a 21 or higher. And we have to get there through rigor. We're going to restructure I-Zone, introduce ACT predictor exam. But we have to start in early grades, K-2. We have to start in early grades, K-2. Literacy is so important. By the time a student is in third grade, they should be reading at or above grade level. At or above grade level. So how are we going to do that? Establish a universal funding program, K-2, as well as provide support in second grade with teacher assistance. I had an old, uh, old college professor, uh, Dr. Richard Green, at the University of Memphis. And you guys know I'm a lifelong Memphian. And Dr. Green often talked about the third grade guarantee. So that's what I want. By the time students in third grade, I want them to read at or above grade level. Social emotional learning. We have to have the support in place to ensure our students are ready to learn. Childhood trauma is real. I shared with principals this morning. I saw a student at Sonix, headphones on, listening to music. I thought she was getting ready to go to work, but she was working vigorously on homework, just working. And I noticed she was just working and moving her head. Went to talk to her. I said, hey, you getting ready for your next shift? I said, you doing homework? She said, no, sir, I don't work here. I said, well, why are you at Sonic doing your homework? She said, I'd rather do homework at Sonic to put up with what I have to put up with at home. Childhood trauma is real. And she began to tell me stories about her home life. She'd rather study at Sonic than at home. Schools are a microcosm of larger societies. So these are some of the next steps. <coughs> Adverse childhood experiences. We want to be, as a school district, we want to be trauma responsive school district. And it starts with the board all the way down into the classroom. And so one of the things, going back to my students, and these students are top students. They never get in trouble. They've never been suspended. Come to school every day. But let's assume these 10 students represent the entire district. African American and Latino boys make up 40% of the students, or same. African American and Latino boys make up four or forty percent of our district. Now, assuming the same students represented, 
1% of the students who were expelled in SES in 2017, black and brown boys, nearly make up 7% of the district expulsion. 70%. And it's not just Shelby County Schools. For every one white student referred to juvenile court, three black men or women were sent. Three black men or women were sent. So we have a problem. We have to do better. We have to tend to the needs of our students. But it takes all of us in a community to pull together, work together, and be examples for our young men and women. So we want to provide additional counselors to better support schools, develop information awareness campaign, school community, increase the knowledge about this issue. Even with our Hispanic students, they're fearful because of everything they hear in the news. They're fearful to come to school. They're traumatized. But we have to let all students know schools <coughs> are a safe place for you. And we're going to wrap our arms around all students. And we're going to speak life to some of the data that I talked about. Servant leadership. Servant leadership is very important. And my dad always taught me and talks about leading by example. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to be here for the students in Shelby County and model for the entire district. And I just recently appointed a few people we have just named to assist building the spirit of servant leadership. Jericho Phillips, you all know, and Dr. John Barker, both will be on the front lines to support our external stakeholders. And I developed a new org chart, inverted org chart. The superintendent is at the bottom. I'm the least among you when it comes to importance. Our students, they're at the top. And I mean it. And whomever sits on cabinet or in our schools, we're going to, we're going to have a servant attitude. This is why we're here, these students. Last but not least, the other four culture building, one, alignment of resources. I see our Deputy Superintendent Lynn Johnson's here. But we're going to be great stewards of public dollars. And we're going to ensure that the money that we have is funneled back to the classroom. Footprint proposal. That's a part gift from Superintendent Emeritus Hops. We here at East T-STEM, we could have been in the district building or found another place, but we're here for a reason. Just a few steps in the old East High School is some of the half a billion, half a billion dollar of deferred maintenance that we talk about in this footprint proposal. You go see it right here at the East High School, ceiling tile, heat. But we must lead through academics first. We must lead through academics first to complete the footprint proposal. It's important. We want to listen to the community. We want to listen to teachers. And we're going to listen to our students. And we're going to do what's best for students. So no decisions have been made. I've been all over the county. And one of the hot topics, footprint proposal. Are you closing my school? There has been no proposal.
to close any schools. Not by me. Not by the school board. So we're still meeting, hashing all of that out. And we're going to allow the academic proposal through, for, through the footprint lead the way. District office transition, last one. We bought a new building on Jackson. We want to engage our central office. We want to have a nice building to where the public can be proud of and to uplift that community. So these are the seven next steps to Destination 25, 2025, Leadership Pledge. We'll put the best interests of students first. Actively listen and be transparent in our decision-making process. My dad is 88 years old. And I was visiting with him Sarah. And he talked to me, he was talking to me about the job. And he asked me a key question. Made me reflect. He asked me, what motivates your actions? What motivates your actions? All the decisions you're going to make, what motivates your actions? And I had to think. And I called him back later that afternoon because he asked me to ponder on that question. I said, Dad, what motivates my actions? Are the students love of students of Shelby County Schools. All decisions will be made in the best interest of students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Um, we'll open it up for a few questions. Um, our time is a little bit limited, so we apologize in advance. No questions. resources to ensure that when we prioritize dollars, we prioritize them back to the classroom. If there's a cut, try to protect the classroom first. So what, what might that look like? Or is that still in flux? Or? Still in flux. Still working through the budget process. You'll learn more about that next month. say this, if you go back to slide, social emotional learning, we have to train and educate. No child should be bullied. Every child should feel safe when they come to school. And if that's not happening, I would love to know more. But we've got to protect our precious resource, and that's our children. And if a child is being bullied, they should report it to the principal, to a school counselor, or an adult, and that matter should be addressed immediately. I've been talking to students who say that they are reporting it, but it's just not being taken seriously. And if you prefer to talk afterwards. I would love to learn more. Okay. And I would love, love to know the specific school and issue, okay. and I guarantee you um, we'll address it. Okay. Over the next five years. Yeah. Is that um, something that you are in agreement with as well, or what are your thoughts Well, first I want to engage the public, then uh, meet with the board and go through the plan. Uh, however, in that plan, we only discuss brick, mortar, buildings, 
academics must lead the way. So I know uh, Dr. Bird, White Law, and working with Beth Phelan, they're working together to see, to unpack that. And uh, soon we'll have a board retreat, working with the board, and uh, seeing what's best for students. I know that you talked about um, deferred maintenance. Um, so does that mean that we could see school closures when you start to, you know, find that money to deal with the deferred maintenance? I mean, you guys are looking at millions of dollars. Well, the first step is, again, engage the public. When you close a school, you have to look at all academic options. And we're not going to make a rush decision. But however, we have to look at the building's conditions, all the building conditions our children are in now. So we're going to make an informed decision. We're going to look at the plan, and we're going to do what's best for children. And that timeline? We're going to work, engage the public first, and work with the board. And then we'll move uh, as needed. Uh, we're at an interesting time where the state is also in leadership plus, you know, the governor and the state commissioner. What are some of the ways that you're looking to um, start that relationship? And, you know, are you picking up the mantle of the state funding lawsuit? Just things like that. Well, let me say, uh, that's why I'm wearing green. I want to renew. And we're at the state uh, day on the hill, so I get an opportunity to meet with state legislators and, and hopefully meet the new commissioner. Uh, at the end of the day, we're going to lobby and do uh, what's best for the students in Shelby County. Do you plan on picking up the mantle of the, the funding losses? Uh, that's a matter that you know we're going to discuss with the board, and uh, we'll go from there. Last question, please. Yes. What uh, issues have you seen in the, what problems in the Hispanic Latino community that have been in the past and what are, what are some uh, things that you like working on in the future while you're here? So I met with uh, Mauricio Calvo, Latino Memphis, and we talked about student attendance. Mm -hmm. And we talked about some of our students not starting to school the first day. And as we started to look at the data and talking and just cold calling some parents, we found out they were fearful to come to school. They were afraid. They, they didn't know that schools were a safe place because of the rhetoric they heard on television. And once we engaged and, and, and set out our community support to really educate parents, we started seeing a shift in it. So that's one, that's one big issue. I think the second question, second part to that. What, uh, well, you answered it kind of, okay. what are you, what are the plans to correct that problem uh, and or, or organizations that you're working with to correct that? You know, Latino Memphis. Uh, yeah, the uh, Mexican consulate. Right. And Tyler just reminded me he was here. But also just avenues to make our students feel safe. And a Mexican consulate has been so great in providing uh, their support to the parents in our school district. Any opportunities for undocumented uh, students that are graduating uh, programs for the universities, uh, colleges? Marisa and I discussed that, and that's something we're both partnering and, and hopefully have a proposal uh, for local universities. Okay, I apologize. I do have to get superintendent to his next meeting. So I will stay behind. A few members of our team that will stay behind. We'll take any other follow-up questions. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. We appreciate your time. As always, we're available. Send us uh, your inquiries to media relations at SCNA. K12.org and we'll be able to answer them. Thank you.